Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I just got to thinking as I was watching that and reading through all those, that little clip from Young Shelton I played last week about how there's 5.3 billion people in the world and you're the perfect mother for me. What a great message for his mom that day. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, what a beautiful, beautiful day it is outside today. So have to make sure you're not sitting in the house all day long and uh, get out and have a little bit of fun. And, and you've got your big hammer now, so yes. you're all set. So uh, it means I got to work today. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So today is the day that we celebrate mothers, grandmothers, stepmothers, step-in mothers for guidance, love, caring that they brought into our lives. And, and it's a great day to celebrate them. And, and, and it's more than just saying, hey, good job, but you need to celebrate all that love that they gave over the years. And uh, we need to make that effort if we're still able to, to let our mother know how much they mean to us and how grateful we are for what they've done. Uh, ladies, on the back table, there's a, a pitcher full of roses, so I invite you to take one. I will warn you ahead of time, I just thought about it as I'm standing here looking at that vase full of roses and I'm going, I didn't trim the thorns off those already, so be careful if you take one with you today. But please, please take one with you. So welcome to Grace Street Church. If you're watching online this morning, please say hi in the notes so that we know that you're there and that you're with us here this morning. And uh, we got, as usual, pretty busy week. Yesterday we had orange track racing. And that was a really good time, and, and it's always fun to watch those things go. And I'll tell you what, I think yesterday we had more close races on these cars than I think I've ever seen. And I mean, we, it's really neat because we have these little photo finish down there, and it automatically shows who won by the lane that they're in, four lanes wide. I watched that a couple of times because I don't think there's any way that we would have been able to tell other than that. As a matter of fact, I think they had to re-race one race because it went down and they couldn't get uh, couldn't catch it so great time was had for all yesterday this Wednesday we're going to continue on with the engagement project and uh, so this week we're going to be talking about another epic in there and if we remember from what we were talking about from the truth project we had epics that they went through which was a section of what happened during the creation and all the way up to restoration which we'll get to later on uh, but this week we're talking about the epic of the fall and so not a really happy subject for Mother's Day I know but uh, Pastor Terry I'm sure will work us through that really well uh, seven o'clock we're gonna go through that and kind of a deep dive into who we truly are why we're truly here what God has asked us to do in our lives and about his plan and I had that as my devotion yesterday morning for uh, Orange Track Racing and here as I talked about that what our purpose is and that God had a plan for our life before we were even born so it's amazing to see that the God that created the whole universe is thinking about us and knows about us intimately with each other that's why we need to make sure we stay engaged in a relationship with God so Next Saturday, May 18th, we're going to be showing the movie Son of God. And that is part, uh, that movie came out of the 10 part miniseries from the History Channel uh, on the Bible. And so this summer, when we're done with the engagement project, we start through on the Bible. So we're going to go through that 10, uh, yeah, it's a 10 week miniseries. And uh, so we're going to go through that and, and really take another. Uh, look at how God can speak to us through these kind of uh, really epic, I think was a great word for it. Not epic as an E-P-O-C, but E-P-I-C. Um, I, I love the English language because there's so many things that it sounds the same, not spelled the same, doesn't mean the same. Just like there, 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 and there. So uh, anyway, we're going to be showing Son of God next Saturday night. Uh, right in here so we'll convert this all over and we'll have refreshments and everything as usual in here and while they last and it should be really really good um, then 
June 1st, guess what? It's men's breakfast time again. So we get to play with food again. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, experiment around. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I realize that, you know, we've been asked about biscuits and gravy pie. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going, all right, the more I think about it, the more I'm just going to have to go out and make it. So I, I'll probably make a biscuits and gravy pie uh, for men's breakfast. This I think I'll go to McDonald's. Oh, I thank you, Jimmy. Yeah, I appreciate the vote of confidence. <laughs> so June 1st at 9 a.m., be here for that. It's always a good time. We have a, a devotion in there, so we kind of make people think before they leave for the day, and it's a great time to just fellowship together. Uh, June 16th, uh, we will be having, again this year, uh, we're going to be out there hosting the Cedar Rapids Freedom Festival Flag Retirement, and we also honor the fallen veterans uh, last year we read 307 names, so we honor the fallen veterans from uh, our area over here that have uh, passed through the last year. So uh, that's going to be June 16th, 4 p.m. out at Lowe's Park in Marion. And then after that, if that wasn't good enough, we are having Orange Track Racing again. Now, I want to tell you, we're, we're not able to do it in June, so we won't be racing in June. So we're moving it all the way over to July. So July 13th will be our next race day here. And so make sure we, we kind of tried to clue everybody in again last week and or yesterday and, and make them know. So we, ha we actually had them vote for June and July for uh, ribbon zips. So if you don't know what that is, you gotta show up and find out. Uh, today's worship, uh, our music and the trailers and things will be in the tiny URL that we will be posting up uh, for all the people on, online so they can see it and share in the music. Seeing how we can't transmit it out, they can tune it in. So let's go to uh, let's go to God in prayer, open up our service today with a word of prayer from others. Lord God, we come before you this morning with humble hearts and humble minds. We come before you hungry for your word and longing for a right relationship with you. Father God, on this day we celebrate your love. We lift up those who have given us life those who have loved us, those who have blessed us, and those who have taught us, our mothers. May your blessing pour out upon the woman who gave us birth and those beautiful, strong women of faith who have been mothers to us all along our journey of life. We praise you, O Lord, for your gift of motherly love, both gentle and fierce, both strong and humble, both kind and true. And where we have been so blessed, we give our grateful praise to you for having provided loving hands that have worked so hard in raising us, cared enough to correct us <laughs> at times, and blessed us in so many ways that we cannot have fully known as children. We call forth your compassion upon every mother who has unknowingly caused pain and suffering. And so we lift up our mothers to you today, perfect and unperfect also wounded by this world, and yet cared for. We bless our mothers this day, no matter what they have done or left undone. We do this because we believe in your healing, we believe in your love, and we believe that you love every mother, good or bad. And we stand together with all mothers in solidarity, for we all are in need of your grace, your mercy, and your love. And where we have failed because we didn't know better, Help us to forgive ourselves as well. Where we have seen your face in any woman who has been a mother to us, in her face we have seen your light and your love, and we give thanks for where they have loved, where they have kept your word and lived it out and blessed us through our lives. We lift you to the prayer of every mother who has ever loved and lost, and that you stood by them in their time. Lord, we thank you for being with us here today and standing with each and every one of us every day of our lives, whether we feel your presence or not. Lord, you are true and faithful to us, even in our times of disobedience. Your love never fails and never falters. Lord, bless us today as we go forth into the world and we will know your presence and thank you for all this. Jesus' name. Amen. Our call to worship this morning 
comes from John 8.44 from the New Living Translation. And it says, For you are children of your father, the devil, and you do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning, and he has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of all lies. That's a hard thing to follow up with with the Mother's Day prayer I just read. But the thing about it is, it's true. We have a dichotomy in our lives. We have a dichotomy in our world. We face good and evil each and every day of our lives. And so we need to understand that evil does exist. And Satan is the source of all evil. And as we continue today through this sermon series on the Engagement Project, we're going to be talking about that epic EPOC of the fall today and what it means for us all. So I'm looking forward to the message that Pastor Terry has, has uh, been given by God to share with us today. So let's take a look at this a little bit. Jesus' mission was to communicate eternal truth and the personal reality of God while he, while he walked among us and then by design to all people through us. So make sure you understand that concept. So as he walked the earth, he showed us, he gave us the living example of that eternal truth of God. Because God is truth and God is love. That personal reality of who God is, is how we base our relationship with God. Jesus in person and in action was the truth. To love the truth is to love Jesus. That's another point I want you to take home with you today. The Son was sent by the Father to bring us that living example of love, of grace, of mercy. And he expects us then to be in relationship with him and to live that out. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> to live that out in our lives each and every day. That's our part. God's done his part. He sent Jesus. Jesus did his part on the cross. It's up to us to do our part as we live out that truth, that love, that grace, and that mercy as a light that shines before all. So if we fail to understand this is a sure sign that a person does not belong to God and is not saved by God because we haven't made that personal commitment to God. So, Jesus cannot be dismissed as a bad ancestor or being demon-possessed as he was being charged with as he was driving out demon and doing mighty deeds and acts while he walked among us in here. Nor was he a self-seeking egotist. You have a hard time to find somebody in society today that could perform a sign and wonder and not go and see what I've done. But what did he do every time he did it? He would pray to the Father. He would invoke the Holy Spirit. He would perform that miracle to bring glory only to God. And that's what we are supposed to be doing today. He was an obedient servant of the Father seeking salvation for every person. And as such, he's greater than any person who ever lived. He is eternal. He is the eternal I am. And as we contrast to Satan, he is the epitome of evil and suffering. Satan confuses people by making them think they're following God when they're actually following his evil plans. We must constantly check our lives by Christ's teachings rather than by any human traditions. Anything that's preserved or taught even by religious institutions. See, there's a lot of people who are just simply going through the motions and don't have a relationship involved with God in their lives. You want to have a Christ-centered life, not a church-centered life, not a Bible-centered life. You want to have a Christ-centered life, meaning Jesus Christ is your living example of how you will live out your faith to others. Amen. Lord, we ask a special blessing on Pastor Terry this morning as he brings us his message of hope 
as he brings us his Mother's Day message. And then he has to contrast that with the fall on that river of death today in that epic that we're going to be studying. So I just ask that you would bless him and bless us at the same time. I invoke the Holy Spirit to come among us and to dwell within us today as we hear this message so that we can take it to our hearts and that we can be totally and completely blessed by this message. So Father God, we just ask that you would open our ears to hear, our eyes to see the wonders and the blessings of each and every day, our heart to accept those and for us to live out your love each and every day. In Jesus' precious name. start with a, uh, a poem. It's called When You Thought I Wasn't Looking. And, uh, it reads like this. This is all the things she taught you just by being an excellent example. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you hang my first painting on the refrigerator and I wanted to paint another one. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you feed a stray cat and I thought it was good to be kind to animals. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw you make my favorite cake for me, and I knew that little things are special things. When you thought I wasn't looking, I heard you say a prayer, and I believed there is a God I could always talk to. When you thought I wasn't looking, I felt you kissed me goodnight, and I felt loved. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw tears come from your eyes, and I learned that sometimes things hurt, but it's all right to cry. When you thought I wasn't looking, I saw that you cared and I wanted to be everything that I could be. When you thought I wasn't looking, I looked. And I wanted to say thanks for all the things I saw when you thought I wasn't looking. <coughs> it's, even after all these years since mom's gone, it's still difficult. I know you got a little choked up there too, Mark. No problem is you can't see through glasses. <laughs> That's true. Can't read through the tears. No. They make the words look funny. <laughs> From Proverbs 31, 25 and 31. It says she is clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise and she gives instructions with kindness. She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. Her children stand and bless her. Her husband praises her. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty does not last, but a woman who fears the Lord will be greatly praised. Reward her for all she has done. Let her deeds publicly declare her praise. Now there's many times that, well, over the last now five and almost five and a half years that we've been uh, having church, that Mark and I have talked about how people see what we do and then compare it to what comes out of our mouth. And they can tell when those two don't go together. Not all moms are good. As I was writing this, I had all this beautiful stuff about all these wonderful mothers out there, and then I realized that not all moms are good. Now, you may have had a great mother. Thank God for that. You may have had a good one, or a poor one, or even an absent one. For some, you may have had a surrogate mother. This is where God stepped in. That may have been a grandmother, an aunt, a sister, or even the mother of a friend. Growing up, I had second mothers 
they were friends, moms, and we were always welcomed into the home just as if we were their own children. Everyone had their own little individual thing. Mom, my mom was a cookie mom. And her most famous cookie was my grandmother's waffle cookies. So imagine a chocolate cookie made in a waffle iron. The small ones, not the Belgian sauce. And then with chocolate icing on them. And sometimes there would be a little drop of mint in that icing. The chocolate mint. So she was the cookie mom. But regardless, today we celebrate those good moms, and we celebrate those that filled the gap. And we pray for those mothers that are struggling. So as we get ready to hear the message that the Lord has provided today, let us hear this prayer. Lord, thank you for all of these women who have helped to shape us into who we are today. And Father, as I, as I think about that, and I, I we can look at that both at the good moms and the bad moms, because from the good moms, we can take all the things that they did good, and we can say, thank you, Lord, for that, Mother. But for the moms that weren't so great, we can say, Mom, you taught us, Lord, not to do what they did. So we thank you. But Father, we also want to pray for all the moms out there that are struggling right now. Today, Lord, we also want to remember the mothers who have lost children, for those who gave up their babies for adoption, and so that they can have a better life, and for those mothers who adopted those babies, for the mothers who are fostering other children while their own mothers get on their feet. Father, we also pray for those who dream of becoming a mother. May you place other godly women in their lives to help mentor them. Father, we thank you for our mother's love, for how much they cared for us and continue to care for us even now that we are adults. Lord, for those among us who have lost their mothers, may they have fond memories and that their mother's legacy would live on through them. Lord, thank you for giving us our mothers. Amen. Amen. Now, you talked about a segue. This is, that was interesting, because it was an interesting process. <laughs> because you look at this title, Fall, the River of Death. Now, this does just sound like an ominous horror movie. But the River of Death really is. It's not a great thing. But when I thought about how I was going to bring that in, I thought about, I wonder how many moms out there and here in person and watching online have heard their children say, and imagine this coming from a three-year-old, I can do it on my own. I don't need your help. How many teenagers said the same thing? How many adult children might even be saying the same thing even when you're trying to impart on them advice that will help them. How many times have you run into someone said, no, not that way. You need to do it like this. I've been meeting with a couple as they prepare to get married and I said, you got to not have these little dis or disagreements because t take it from me, I've been married now, at the end of the year, be 24 years, do not argue about how to fold towels. Just fold them and put it in the cabinet, whatever works. Those little things aren't to worry about. But a lot of people out there, especially people that are, are just in and of the world, they won't be happy unless it's done their way. Now granted, there are things that have to be done a certain way. You cannot, we were talking this morning about uh, medications for diabetes. You cannot just willy-nilly put those medications together. So there are some things we have to, but other things, does it really matter if you put the milk in the bowl first and then the eggs or the eggs in the bowl and then the milk as you're making French toast? No, it doesn't. And when we try to do things our own way, how's that go for you? Usually not so well. It might work out great in the beginning. It might start off doing really well, but in the long run, it just, 
it kind of falls apart. Now, in our next session on Wednesday night, we're going to dive deeper into the message today, going through that second uh, epoch, E P O C H, as I was telling us, of the God's meta narrative. So last week we started with creation and how quickly we get to the fall. The message last week was creation, the end game. We heard about the beauty of creation. And we learned a lesson in heavenly citizenship in the process. And that God's end game is life, here and eternally with him. Adam and Eve were part of that creation, created in God's image. And God had given them dominion over the entire earth, everything. Then, or the but, then Satan talked Adam and Eve into doing something his way. You don't need God's help. I, these, this is a Terry paraphrase, so. You don't need God's help. Just eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Then you will be like God. And you can do things your way. Now, we've all tried doing things our way, and when we look back at them, hindsight is 20, 20. You don't even need glasses for that. You can see how that went just poorly. The perfect balance that had been created by God when everything was made was gone. The beauty and fruitfulness of creation changed to death and decay, to being held captive by it our own sin. God's beautiful river of life had been transformed into a river of death. And now we know Satan's endgame. Death. When they were finally confronted by God, did you ever take time to realize or notice that neither one of them took responsibility for their own actions? Like the little kids, he did it. She did it. Adam's like, she did it. She made me do it. She, can you imagine the look on her face like, you betrayed me. And she's pointing at the serpent going, he did it. He made me do it. He didn't make you do anything. He provided a temptation and you took it. The blame game. Eternal paradise lost as they were evicted from the Garden of Eden. And then, what did God do? Scripture tells us in Genesis that he placed a cherub at the entrance of the garden so that they would not be able to get back in and live forever by eating, live forever by eating from the tree of life. Hence, Satan and his end game of death. Satan knows just what to say and do to manipulate us. In a little bit uh, more of the passage from what Mark read this morning for our call to worship, we can look at John 8, 42 through 47, where it says, Jesus told them, If God were your Father, you would love me, because I have come to you from God. I am not here on my own, but he sent me. Why can't you understand what I'm saying? It's because you can't even hear me. For you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So when I tell you the truth, you just naturally don't believe me. Which of you can truthfully accuse me of sin? And since I am telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? Anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the words of God. But you don't listen because you don't belong to God. So I came by, a question popped into my head. Are you making it all about yourself and what you want? Is it all about you? There's, somebody did it. Christian parody song 
20 odd years ago, and it's called All About Me. <laughs> and I couldn't find it. If I could have found it, I would have thrown it into the link for people to watch. But it's true. We make it all about ourselves. So that brings us to the three consequences that we're going to talk to about today, about losing God's meta narrative. The first one is, it's all about me and what I want. Now you can tell me all day who you are, but your actions do speak louder. Your actions show who you really are and who you really belong to. That's what Jesus is telling us here. Satan's actions show who he really is, the father of lies. And those lies are what led us down this river of death. Now, when someone speaks God's truth, people naturally do not want to believe it. They've been hearing the lies for so long. When we try to tell someone truth, you ever run up against that? It's like running your head long into a brick wall. If someone has heard false truths and lies long enough they start to believe them. Jesus ran into this too, so we're in good company. Think about it. You tried to have that conversation and tell them the truth and why won't you believe me? Doesn't matter what you say or what you do. I gotta believe you. Once God's truth is spoken, Satan will then use people's stubbornness, their pride and prejudice to keep them from believing it. And unfortunately, until Christ returns, Satan's going to continue to use people, whether consciously or not, to keep the work of God from moving forward. No question. How do I know if I'm listening to God or if I'm listening to Satan? It's really simple. You know, when we think about uh, some of the things that we've read in the Bible, go dip yourself seven times in the Jordan and you will be healed. Well, that was too easy, so you know, you've got to get upset about it. But it's really simple. We just read the instructions that God has given to us in the Bible. So let's jump to John chapter 10, looking at verses 1 through 10. I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And after he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them. And they follow him because they know his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Those who, under, who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. So he explained it to them. I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers. But the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. A good shepherd, they're always up front and honest. They're not deceitful. They always protect. And he, listen to this one. They don't drive, they lead. We talk about children this morning. We talk about moms. Children knows their mom and dad's voice. I can, even after all these years, I can still hear my mom's voice. Unfortunately, some of the things that she did to teach me or to correct me don't work moving forward. She used to give, they had that look. Remember mom's look? Or my mom, she had a squeeze. She'd be sitting next to you and she'd squeeze your knee. 
Chris is back there almost ready to fall out of her chair laughing because I tried that once with her when she was little. I never heard a child screech so loud. Didn't work. But a child knows a parent's voice. So as children of God, if we are truly children of God, we will know God's voice and we will follow it. Yet like a thief, Satan takes life. He doesn't give it. Let's go back to the fall. Because Adam and Eve believed in Satan's lies, they lost eternal life in the garden. Satan made it all about them, and, well, they fell for it. It became about them and not about God. When I mean, it's all about me and what I want, well, then you know you've fallen into Satan's trap. Too often our personal agendas do get in the way of truth. Turn on the TV, watch the news, read the paper, go online, read all the patrols garbage that is out there. Everybody has a personal agenda and they will twist and turn the truth. We see it even with the scriptures. Twisting and turning truth to make it fit their own narrative. Now what does this do? Well, it can lead to fights. Not always physical ones, but it can lead to those. But it leads to verbal fights between friends, co-workers, even church families our own families, even between husbands and wives. Now, in a Christian wedding ceremony, you'll hear Matthew 19, 6, or a paraphrase of the verse. And that verse reads, Since they are no longer two, but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. A paraphrase of this might be, What God has joined together, do not let the world or other people tear apart. This can also be said of a relationship with Jesus. Don't let anyone or anything tear apart that relationship. So when we think about the world that revolves around us, you know, sometimes that can lead to a very lonely life. And that leads us to our second point, isolation and loss of relationships. We tend to isolate ourselves from others. And when we do, what happens? Yeah, you can get a little bitter. And you can always see yourself as a victim. Oh, woe is me. It's just crazy what God will put in your head as you're preparing. As The first thing I thought of, and granted we're like 200 and some odd days away from Christmas, but yeah, I thought immediately thought of the Grinch. His isolation from the world led to a disconnect from the world. He was bitter. He was angry. He was rude. He was mean. He was obnoxious. And that list could go on. That's not who we are to be as God's children. In fact, Paul tells us what happens when we give in to our simple nature and what the fruits of that will be. Look at Galatians 5, 19 and 21, where it says, When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, self-ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. We live in a fallen world. Each of us will have these evil desires. I don't care who you are, a pastor or someone else. You, these are going to happen to you at some point, somewhere along the line. You may be having a bad day. Everything's going wrong. You're in pain. The world's falling apart and somebody cuts you off and all of a sudden, outburst of anger. We can't ignore them. We can't pretend that they're not there. They're not going to go away. Yet. I say yet because when Jesus comes to take his kingdom, 
they will. But each of these things alone, individually, can lead to isolation. Throw them all together, and that's a recipe for a huge disaster. These are the things that lead us down this river of death. God's not leading you down that path. He never would. But Satan will. And this bad fruit destroys relationships. How often have you heard the saying of one bad apple runs the entire bunch? Because of this, people lose trust in one another. And eventually, that leads them to start not trusting other things, which can lead to them not trusting in God. These attitudes and emotions cause us to stifle the work of the Holy Spirit in and through us. And when that happens, there's no way for us to allow the Holy Spirit to produce good fruit. Which, let's look at the next part of Galatians. 22 and 23 says, But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. There is no law against these things. These are the things that will happen when we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. While the works of the flesh in the verses 19 through 21 lead to destruction, these bring life. It's no longer about me, but about everyone else. These are the things that let others see God through us. So we go from dependency to true freedom. Satan wants us dependent on him and his lies. He wants to control us, keep us under his thumb, if you will. The Bible doesn't say it, but I can imagine that what Satan might have thought after getting Adam and Eve eat of that fruit words. You're mine now. When we don't have God as our focus, we lose meaning in our lives. Our incentive and our purpose are gone. And we're floating down that river of death. That 20 hindsight, 2020 hindsight that I mentioned earlier, well, Adam and Eve had to have come to that realization as soon as they lost that true freedom. God did not want that for them or for us. He wanted us to flourish. God, through his love, he gives us life. He gives us true freedom. <clears throat> now, there are a lot of false teachings out there. A lot of books that have been written. A lot of books that have reported to have been written by specific people. A lot of teachings. A lot of people who've taken the scriptures and just totally twisted them. Guess what? Satan has a party when you do that. He's thrilled by it. Because that's leading you down that river of death. You know, Satan's probably okay with you doing a lot of things that you might think he wouldn't want us to do. You know, he's probably just happy as can be if you pick up your Bible and you start reading it. He's okay if you go to church. He's okay if you go to that prayer meeting. But if that's all that it is, that's all you're doing, and you stop there, he's got you. Because you're not going to get attacked. He's not going to come after you until you put this into action. When you do that, Satan's not happy. He'll come for you. Now, and this is a, a, another sermon for another time. We are all gifted. I talk to people about this all the time. You're so good at what you do. It's like, yeah, but... And I've 
probably already found out what they do. Talk to a guy as a plumber. Like, dude, you do not know how much I appreciate you and the gifts that God has given you. Because I make a mess of plumbing. Electrical, I'm okay. Making some an Ethernet cable? Yep, I'm all over. I cross patch straight. Doesn't matter. I'm good at that. No, don't mess with water. We ended up having to shut the main off every day for two weeks because I screwed up the faucet. This has been like 20 years ago, so it was much easier to run down, up and down the steps at that point. But we're all gifted. We all come together and bring our own giftings and what we're good at. So sometimes when we want people to go and do something that we think is a good idea to reach others, we're not all gifted that way. We might be gifted in a different way. <laughs> but the thing that we can't do is not use them. God gave us those gifts and talents. We need to use them for the kingdom. When we don't put our faith in action, well, I've used this saying before, you're just pewing in the pews. Think about it. When water becomes stagnant, what happens? Well, think about it. Some of you might have that basement laundry room toilet that nobody ever uses, and every once in a great while you go down there and Remember, you probably need to clean it and you open it up and it's like, mm, that's nasty. It'll stink. Mold starts to grow. Wastes away. That's what happens to our faith. If we don't use it, it gets stinky. It wastes away. James tells us in 217 that faith that does not produce good deeds is dead and useless. Now we wait with the hope that we have for what God promised. He promised us a river of life, not a river of death. And we go from the river of life in the, the, New, or in the Old Testament in Genesis, and then we end up the fall, and then we've got the river of death. And then how does he end the book? The river of life. The tree of life. Romans 8, 20 and 23 says, Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan. Even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. So you each have a choice to make. Is it easy to go with the flow? You bet. I think of, when I think about rivers, I think about people who get on their punt or on their uh, their floaties and, and the tubes and they just float lazily down the river. They don't have to do anything. Well, that, when we don't do anything, that leads us down a river of death when it comes to our faith. Are you going to flow down that river of death? Or are you going to get up and work to reverse that flow? Remember, it's not about you. It's about his story. Is about God and what He wants to do through you. Father, you gave us such wonderful gifts in our parents. And today, we celebrate our mothers, whether they're still with us or not. We thank you for that. And Father, as a father myself, I look at my daughters who do have kids, their own, and I see how wonderfully they take care of them. But it's not always about having a biological child. We have one daughter who's a teacher who every one of those kids is her kid. She's adopted them, them into her family, just as you adopt us into yours. 
Father, don't let us get complacent. Don't let us float down this river of death. Father, as Philip Yancey's book says, if you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. Father, teach us to hear your word and to put Satan's word out of our minds. Help us to live righteously in your eyes, Father. By accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior and living out our faith as prompted by the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Pastor Jerry. As we come into this time of, uh, wow, of communion this morning, uh, I want you to be thinking about Jesus as he was on the cross, as he was giving up his life for us, as he was making that commitment to us to endow us with salvation, to endow us with his spirit to live amongst us and within us and to indwell within us from here to the eternity if we do our part, if we say yes, if we believe, if we have faith, if we follow the tenets of his teaching. And as Terry was giving his message this morning, a couple of years ago I gave a message and I, the illustration I used about that spiritual warfare that's going on within us all the time. You had that little angel on one shoulder and the little devil talking in your ear on the other shoulder. And you're going, well, how do you know which voice you're listening to? And see, that brings us back to that Galatians 5 as Terry had there. You have to read Galatians 5 and it says, if you're listening to these things and it's leading you down this path, to all of this destruction, the sexual immorality, impurity, all those kind of things, anger, then that's not the voice of God talking to you. Because it tells you in the next set of verses in Galatians 5, it says, because if you listen to my voice, I will be bring you peace, joy, happiness, self-control. Those fruits of the Spirit that he will give us to help fulfill our lives. And so as we come in this time of communion today, we want to remember those things, to listen to the right voice. And as Jesus went through the week before he, he died and he was crucified, there was a lot of wrong voices shouting at that time, very loud, and it's easy to fall astray and follow those voices, which is what the people did. <coughs> So on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. Later on in the meal, he took the cup and he filled it and he blessed it and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And in doing so, we partake of the cup of suffering. We partake of his body being broken down. We partake in that celebration of his sacrifice for us. And we are never to forget that because we are to do this in remembrance of him. And he gave us the examples of life. And he warned us of the examples for death. So he tells us exactly what to do. We need to listen and then do our part. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. And as always, thanks be to God. Yes, Doug. Um, yeah, a gentleman that was in the homeless community mm -hmm. um, died from suicide. Oh, I believe it was last week. Mm -hmm. Just prayers for his family. Okay. Okay. Do you want to put his name out there or not? Um, not for sure what his name is. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It was undisclosed. Mm -hmm. 
I will have my chest. Okay. Okay. Anyone else this morning? All right. <coughs> Father God, we come to you this morning giving honor, thanks, praise, and worship to you, mighty God. King of kings, Lord of lords, Prince of peace, you are King of the universe, and we praise your holy name. Let us come together this morning and pray for one another as we read Galatians 3, or Colossians 3, 13 through 15. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body we were called to peace. And be thankful. Father God, help us in America to be people of forgiveness towards others, as you have forgiven us. Give us the strength to let go of resentment and embrace compassion. May your love guide us on this journey of forgiveness, bring healing and restoration to all your relation, all our relationships. For with you, God, all things are possible. And uh, Father, part of your great love is praying for others and helping others in need. So today we lift up Lori's mom, Diane, to you. We pray the blood of Jesus, your healing power, wash over her and keep her steady on her feet. We pray for healing from the fall that she has taken and ask that you hold on to her in Jesus' name. We ask for the peace that passes all understanding to be with Lori and Mark as they face the days ahead. Father God, we lift up Steve and Marlene who had a house fire this past week. We ask that you surround them with love from their neighbors and put Christian people in their path, that they can help them get back on their feet after this tragedy. I also ask for the towns with people who have uh, been ravished by tornadoes again. Give them hope out of the devastation in their lives. Help them to rebuild bigger and better than before. Get them the help they need each day. And through it all, I pray if they don't know you, that they will find you in the trials they are facing. Help them not to lose heart in sight of you, for you are the God that sustains us through all things. I lift up my friend Chris and her daughter Megan, my brother David, Steve's brother Larry, and mom Jen. They are all fighting cancer and battles of the flesh. I ask for healing and knowledge, caregivers, to, help, to know how to help them, give them, get them through the trials they are facing. Lord, bring them to you and help them know that you are God and they are not alone. Father God, we lift up our homeless to you to lift them up and out of their current situations. And we ask for the um, just love be placed on the family of the one that has um, taken his life this last week, Lord God. They are in such despair, Father God. And I just pray that you put Christian people in their path and lift them up and out of these the trials that they are in, Lord God. Help them to know that there is another way, and you are the way and the truth and the life for, all, for everyone, Lord Jesus, not just for a few. And we ask you, Lord, to walk with our children and grandchildren daily. Put a hedge of protection around them and draw them nearer to you. And thank you, Jesus, for all the mothers and grandmas who fight for their children day after day. May God be with all of them and bless them every day of their lives. And as in Galatians 3.17, and whatever you do, within, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Jesus' mighty name. Amen. See them while at least with a mark. I mean. <coughs> sorry, Mark. I'm not sorry. Um, I resemble that. The truth. Nor is the new one. Uh -huh. <laughs> we could sit here and, and probably put the chairs in the circle and talk about our moms all the rest of the day. 
they had an impact on us, good or bad, they had an impact on us. Like I mentioned before, it is in our legacies as we look at our moms and as we look at grandmothers and mothers and then children as to how those children have looked back at those examples that they were given. And while I wish mom was here to give a hug to today, or even a phone call, heck, I even miss the days when mom would call him just to complain about my brother. It's the little things. But it is her faith, and, and it is because of the things that she did that I stand before you today. So I thank God for my mom. I thank God for each of your mothers as well. And if they're still here, make sure you give a big hug. But the beauty, like I mentioned before, is that I know where my mom's going. I made the point of point blank asking her. Did that with my dad as well. So I know someday we'll be together again. But as we close out this portion of our service, one more prayer for the moms. Heavenly Father, on this day of ours, I pray to you that you will bless every mother on earth. Let their lives be filled with laughter and joy, surrounded by the love of family and friends. May you grant them health and peace and spiritual satisfaction as they bravely pursue their mission in life. Please make them feel important. Let them know that they are important to us and that they are precious, so precious to you and in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen.